Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the third in our speaker series for Smart Women, Smart Power. I'm Dr. Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS. And I also have the good fortune of leading the Smart Women, Smart Power initiative, which seeks to amplify the voices of women in foreign policy, security, and international business. And I want to thank all of you for joining us here in the room, but also those who are joining on the web. Um, and of course, since it's the 21st century, we have to remind you to please follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at SmartWomen. Um, please go ahead and pull your phones out now to add, add that to your uh, Twitter feed. And I also invite you to check out our podcast series, which is tremendous. Um, that's on iTunes. It's Smart Women on iTunes. I want to take a moment today to thank, in particular, uh, City, which supports this series. And I'd like to briefly turn the floor over to Candy Wolf, who's Executive Vice President and Head of Global uh, Government Affairs at City. So please join me in thanking Candy and City for their support. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for that kind introduction. And welcome to all of you for our third event in the series, uh, Smart Women, Smart Power. This past Sunday, uh, what was it, March 8th, I've lost track of days. I think the snow days have kind of thrown me off. Uh, it is March. But it marked the uh, kickoff of uh, the 2015 International Women's Day. And International Women's Day, I think as many of you know, is celebrated globally. And it's a focus on the economic, political, and social achievements of women. And I want to call attention to cities' activities. We, do a, uh, we spend a lot of time on International Women's Day. We're in 100 countries around the globe. And so it's very important from an employee perspective uh, to participate in International Women's Day. So we kicked off um, with the closing bell last Friday at the New York Stock Exchange uh, to begin the, uh, uh, the month-long uh, celebration. We don't look at it as one day. We look at it as a month-long celebration. And in the month of March, we're going to host 200 events in 90 countries uh, for mostly our clients, our communities, and our employees, all in recognition of International Women's Day. So I can't think of a better way to acknowledge International Women's Day than to hear from our featured guest today, Anne-Marie Slaughter. And I can't think of a better way to have her interviewed than with Nina Easton from Fortune. So I think it's, uh, it's apropos that we have some uh, a great panelist and a great interview in celebration of International Women's Day, or at least in the month of March while we're celebrating International Women's Day. So with that, I, on behalf of City, I want to thank you all for attending uh, this series and appreciate your, your being here. Thanks very much to Candy. So um, as Candy said, I'm pleased to be here to introduce Dr. Anne-Marie Slaughter, who's joined us today. Dr. Slaughter is currently the president and CEO of New America. I first met her when she served as the director of policy planning at the State Department, and she was the first and to date the only woman to serve in that post. A longtime Princeton professor and former university dean foreign policy has described Dr. Slaughter as an innovative, innovative, excuse me, and prolific scholar. That was hard. It's hardly a surprise then that she's here today to challenge conventional thinking on international relations with her views on how to integrate a people-centered approach to foreign policy. Our moderator today, as always, is CSIS senior associate Nina Easton, who is also a colleague columnist at Fortune Magazine and chair of Fortune's Most Powerful Women International Summit. So please join me in inviting Anne-Marie to the podium for some remarks to be followed by a sit-down discussion with Nina Easton. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out in the rain, <laughs> although it's better than the snow. So. <laughs> so when CSIS was founded uh, back in, I think, 1962 uh, in Georgetown, uh, it was the height of the Cold War. And the way we thought about foreign policy was like a chessboard. Uh, it was the world of two principal states, the United States and what now dates those of us who lived through that, the Soviet Union. Uh, my kids look at me very strangely when I say that. Uh, two principal states, the world divided according to where they were uh, on either the U.S. side or the Soviet side or the non-aligned side. Uh, and as we thought about uh, what foreign policy looked like, uh, CSIS was founded a year after uh, Schelling, Thomas Schelling published The Strategy of Conflict. 
And the strategy of conflict essentially is bargaining theory applied to international relations. And it assumes that there's a world of states. There were many fewer states then. Remember when the United Nations was created, they were under 60. We're now at 200, and in the early, by 1962, you're still around, around 100 some. And what you're thinking about, it, when you think about foreign policy, is the world of chess. It is the world of if this state does th this move, that state will respond as follows, and we then will do the following, and you play it out according to how good a chess, board, a chess player you are. That is what I call a power-centered foreign policy. It, we can talk in questions, and Nina's going to bring me down to earth and ask me about very specific cases, but I'm going to play professor uh, for my time uh, to talk to you. Uh, it, so to say that it's power-centered doesn't mean that it's necessarily realist. You can deploy power in the service of values just as much as you can in the service of interest. So I'm not making any claims about uh, whether or not you are realist or liberal internationalist or any of that. But what I am saying is it's a world in which when you think about international relations, you assume that the objects of international relations are states of some number and a smaller number that are great powers, and you assume that the currency of their relations is power, and you assume that in terms of thinking about uh, how you're going to get the outcomes you want, you are engaged in strategic calculations of conflict uh, and, and how to avoid conflict. So, that's the world of power-centered foreign policy. It's the world I grew up in. It's the world I've taught uh, for many years. And I'm guessing most of you who took international relations courses, that sounds like the world you learned about, at least for most of it. Now, you might have had, at the end of those courses, a little bit on global issues, right? Those other things, you know, like development and human rights and climate change and civil war and terrorism and criminal networks, um, you know, those smaller other things. Those were then, by the 1990s, when I was coming of age as a scholar, they were all lumped together as transnational relations. I remember after the, uh, the beginning of the Cold, after the end of the Cold War, the MacArthur Foundation decided it would support a whole lot of work in transnational relations. So this was very deliberately non-interstate, right? It was crossing borders. Uh, it didn't fit in that category of the strategy of conflict of the chessboard world. It's a world of people, people in groups, but groups are just clusters of people. So if you think about any of those issues, as I said, start with development and start of all the entire cluster of issues that are in development were from you know, resource scarcity, food security, water, uh, poverty reduction, jobs, education, health. Just take those. Those are all issues that directly affect people. Of course, states, that those people live within states, but what you're looking at is how you improve the daily lives of people. You are not thinking about how you augment the power of a state although we, we, can make, we can connect them. If you think about climate change, of course, you're thinking the same thing. You're thinking about individual decisions. And now by individuals, I'm going to include corporations, which is just a legal way that individuals uh, do business. I'm going to include civic groups of all kinds. We didn't actually call them NGOs when I was learning international relations, but that was part of, of transnational relations, that whole civic, civil society, transnational civil society, those are civic groups. And then, of course, criminal groups. So, yes, we think about terrorist networks, but Moises Naim's book, Illicit, which is almost, it's over a decade old now, it's probably 15 years old, it's this wonderful book that says, you know, really, terrorists are but one global network. The others, of course, are money laundering, arms trafficking, drug trafficking, intellectual piracy. And his point is, those are just the underside of licit trade. So all those entities, criminal uh, networks, so individuals, civil society, uh, corporations, criminals, and then you could add actually all sorts of nonprofit institutions like this one, like New America, like uh, my former home in, in universities. That 
networked world is the world not of the chessboard, but of the web. And I don't actually mean the World Wide Web, although if you want a physical representation of what that world looks like, the, a map of the World Wide Web is as good as any. It shows you all those networks. It shows you the big nodes and the small nodes. But it is a world of lots and lots and lots of interconnected entities. It is a web. Calcul strategic calculations don't work in that world. And that is a very big problem to which I will return. Our entire frame for thinking about foreign policy is thinking about states and calculations of power, calculations of interest, calculations of value. We can do that either way. But equally important now, because today nobody says they're just that extra couple of sessions at the end of your IR course. They are, if you're at the National Security Council, they're at the core of what you are thinking about much of the time. So that world, the world of the web, exists right next to, on top of, below, however you want to put it, alongside the chessboard world. But in that world, this is why I called it people-centered foreign policy, you have to be focusing on individuals or individuals who've come together as corporations or other kinds of groups. You have to be thinking about their calculations of power. Look at the front page. What are we trying to do right now? We're trying to figure out what motivates young men to join an organization that would have made 7th century medieval uh, torture look civilized. Right? We're trying to figure out what are their motivations, why can't we counter those motivations, to what extent are they religious, to what extent are they the result of absence of op any other kind of opportunity, to what extent are they the result of religious conflict. But these, we're focusing on people. So start with this overall idea of a state-centric chessboard where we think about calculations of power next to a people-centered web, an incredibly dense web of individuals and groups and corporations and criminal organizations. And how do we simultaneously practice the craft of foreign policy in both worlds at the same time? All right, now again, Nina is going to bring me down to earth, but before she does, and meaning she's going to ask me about specific conflicts, I want to talk a little bit about the, the tools that we use in both those worlds, uh, and also how we think about power uh, in each of those worlds. So with the tools, you know, the classic chessboard world, diplomats and embassies work pretty well. Right? I mean, you, the whole idea was the only way you could actually know what another state was doing was to be there and to have people on the ground. And those people were mostly talking to people in other governments, although they were also talking to the business community and trying to get a sense of some people on the ground. But they were located in capitals. And effectively, what I think of, you know, the kind of, of diplomacy that John Kerry has been practicing is the, that's the principal tools. It's people sitting down in dark paneled rooms and trying to negotiate deals and trying to avoid conflict and when there is conflict, engaging in it. In the web world, you need a whole different set of tools. That's what Secretary Clinton and building on what Secretary Rice, uh, indeed Secretary Powell had done before her, uh, trying to build up those tools that allow us, on the one hand, just to have functional knowledge, all the functional parts of the State Department where we think about economics and climate change and energy uh, and criminal networks, but also, and this is the harder part, what are the tools we need to engage people? So Kath stood up and said, well, we're in the 21st century, so we have the hashtag smart women. Who wouldn't like the hashtag smart women? That's great, right? Well, that's social media. Social, if you were inventing foreign policy or diplomacy today, I don't think you'd start with embassies. In fact, I think that's probably the last thing you'd do because it means something that has to be defended uh, thousands and thousands of miles away. It is now possible, in theory, for a government to communicate with every single human being in the world who has a cell phone. And since many human beings in the world have two or three, uh, to communicate with them multiple times. 
So if you started today by thinking, wait a minute, we're in this webbed world of all these different networks, and what we need to do is build relationships with all these different entities, we would not start with embassies. We would start with social media, but we would then think of well, not social media and the other ways through the internet that we can now reach people, we can educate people, we can engage people. That wouldn't mean that there wasn't still room for diplomacy, because while we're thinking about ISIS or thinking about development, Russia's still out there, North Korea's still out there, Cuba's out there. I mean, this is not an either or. This is a both and proposition. But we need all sorts of different tools. And even in terms of how our diplomats are trained, they need to be able to run projects on the ground. They don't need to just go and negotiate. They need to actually get out there and be working with people and have project manager uh, type skills. Uh, they need to be able to bring people together in various ways. Uh, they have a whole, it's a whole sort of different mindset and training. And they need to have all sorts of partnerships. Right? They need to know how to create public-private partnerships, uh, to know how to build networks and coalitions. Again, very different training than traditional diplomatic training. So the tools that we need are very different. If you think about the chessboard world versus the web world or the power-centered world uh, versus a people-centered world, you need tools that allow you to deal with people directly uh, rather than state apparatus. Last thing I want to say there is the, how we think about power. Uh, and this is, I mean, we could, we could write whole books on it. Uh, Joe Nye, who has a deep uh, and wonderful relationship with CSIS, has written, I think he has power in the last five of his book titles. Uh, so there are lots of ways to think about this. But, um, you know, the power in the uh, state-centric chessboard world is essentially the power of coercion. I mean, Joe has written about soft power and the power of attraction, and that's important. I, I definitely think it's important. But really what we're talking about is how you get somebody else to do what you want them to do. Uh, and there are, there's force, there's the economic uh, coercion of various kinds. Uh, there is agenda setting. I mean, as Joe talks about, I mean, if, you, if, you are, if you have enough power to be able to set the agenda, you can get people to do things that way. You can shape preferences. But you're still essentially, you're an entity trying to get another entity to do what you want. And you can fold soft power into that. You could do it by the attraction rather than coercion. In the web world, we're just beginning to think about power and how we wield power and how we actually formulate strategy. I think this is the great task for the next couple of decades, if Schelling set the framework that really took us through the Cold War and after, the, the question today is, how do you think about power when it's a network? You can't tell somebody what to do. Indeed, in a network, the power comes from being at the center, because there is no top. It is the power of being most connected, that's how we knew that Mohammed Atta was the leader of the 9-11 terrorists. He was the one who was connected to everybody else. So the person who's most connected is the most powerful. But how do you use those connections? You can mobilize. You can catalyze. You can uh, often kind of convince others uh, to, to, to uh, do what they want to do and then sort of harness that uh, in, in one common direction. But it's a very understudied and under thought out field. We, many of us do it. Those people who are community organizers probably understand it far better than those of us who are foreign policy experts in terms of how you really exercise power uh, in networks. And what should the strategy be? What network should we try to create? Well, you know, when we're fighting terrorists, we say, well, you've got to fight a network. With, you got to, to beat a network, you have to have a network. So we have counter-terrorist networks. So we've thought, the military's thought through this in some areas, but if we think more broadly, again, about all those big problems of climate change and development issues and all the criminal networks, even intellectual property, what kinds of networks do we create? Who's in them? And how do we actually use them? So I've done what professors do. I've asked more questions than I've answered. But Nina is now going to come up and ask me questions, and I will try to answer them uh, in more specific ways. But if you take nothing else away, I hope when you read the paper tomorrow, you'll look at an article and you'll think to yourself, are we talking about the traditional chessboard world? And if we're talking about Ukraine and Russia, we probably are. 
or are we talking about the web world and how do we put those two together? Thank you. That was great, Anne-Marie. You know, you all should know that um, Anne-Marie, um, you think of her as an academic dean and as a, a State Department official, but in fact, she was a law professor for many years. <laughs> and she was telling us back in the green room when she thinks about running anything involving a poli-sci department and how theoretical that would be that she wants to run screaming from the room and tearing at her hair. <laughs> so um, we're going to go away from that theoretical. Um, you, you're sort of veering a little into the theoretical. I do, and so we want we to bring it down. <laughs> Although it does raise interesting questions. You look at digital um, foreign policy is being shaped so defensively by issues like the Snowden leaks, exactly. by issues like s cyber attacks. Um, you know, the question becomes how do we use technology to further our aims exactly. as opposed to just defending against them? So I wanted to get into that with you. But let's, I, I want to focus on two regions of the world Excellent. and apply this. You mentioned Russia as still being a chessboard. It's also a country where part of our problem is that Putin has the support of 85% of the population. That's a people problem. How do you deal with that? OK, so, um, so d just to set the stage for a minute. So I said at the end and I, that you know, anybody who thinks we're only in a web world hasn't been paying attention, right? The, the, the Russia, Ukraine, Russia, NATO, Russia, the West. I felt you know, when I was at the Brussels Forum last year, it was like, oh, we're back to the future. We, everybody yeah. knows how to play this game. Uh, and in that sense, yes, you are looking at power calculations. You are looking at Russia uh, and, and its place in the world and Putin's ability to play on that with, its, with, with his own people. At the same time, the way to look at it as in the web world, a couple ways. Um, one is absolutely let's look at Russian domestic politics. So you said he has the support of 85% of the people. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on the questions you ask. Because if you ask, do you have faith in the government in Russia, you get a 75% resounding no. Hmm. Right? That's a different question. So you might like Putin, the bare-chested tiger wrestler, mm -hmm. but you don't yeah. think yeah. that the government's doing a okay. decent job. Okay. And Putin is terrified of Ha of what happened in Ukraine happening in Moscow, right? So what we know is in 2011, when, when Navalny was really at his height, that was, Putin was badly scared by hundreds of thousands of people in the, in the streets. And they weren't, they, were, they weren't sort of traditional liberals. There were a lot of people who had been supporting him. That's the point at which he not only cracked down on Navalny, but he absolutely tightens the screws on NGOs and on the internet. One of the ways to understand what's happening in Ukraine is that the worst possible thing that could happen for him is a successful revolution against corruption. But, hmm. Because that is what his people, they may like him, they are fed up with corruption, mm -hmm. and as oil prices drop, he has less ability to buy people off, and that is what he is most frightened of. So my read from a people perspective is he's actually much, much weaker than we might think from the polls, and that that's actually a very dangerous situation. He might, I think there's a not insubstantial chance he will, he will be overthrown by somebody of, uh, within his circle. If not, or even if he's afraid of that, the danger, of course, is that he becomes more and more aggressive because he's weaker and weaker at home. Is there anything, though, that we can do from the outside to affect public opinion in Russia? Nothing as much as what the Saudis are doing. I mean, the single mm -hmm. biggest way you affect public opinion in Russia right oil now prices. is oil prices, absolutely. Yeah. What we can do is something slightly different. I think the administration has been pretty good about this, which is to avoid making ourselves the enemy. So early, because that plays absolutely to his strengths. You know, the United States, Russia is back on the world stage. The United States is focusing on us. So right after he, uh, he invaded Crimea and then Eastern Ukraine, the United States immediately jumped up and said, we're negotiating with you. My, my feeling there was, no, no, no. You want to make this more a European issue. You do not want to make it so that he can say, it's once again the two superpowers. It's Russia and the United States. And what about the Ukraine? I mean, you are somebody, you talk about tools in a toolbox. You're not somebody who's shy about using military force as a, uh, as a tool, and we'll talk about that a bit later. But talk about um, applying uh, your people-centered approach to the Ukraine, and should we be arming Ukrainians? Hmm. 
Um, so I, the first point is I, I have never called for using force in Ukraine. I mean, the, 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 um, for many reasons, but we are, we are still talking about a nuclear state, and that, that does change the calculus a great deal. I think the starting point with Ukraine is once again to ask not whether Ukraine the state wants to be part of the EU or part of the, of the Russian uh, near abroad, what do the Ukrainian people want? And what the Ukrainian people want more than anything is just a decent government, right? They tried in, in, with the Orange Revolution, they're trying again, they want a government that delivers the basic things that the governments next door to them, right? Mm -hmm. In Poland and the Baltic states are delivering. It, if you look at it that way, and more about what they want and less about, well, is this Ukraine gonna be part of the EU or part of Russia's sphere? Then you're focusing much more on the economic side, mm -hmm. much more. You, I mean, yes, it, it's a major problem for them in terms of investment that Russia's destabilizing their Eastern Front, but that is still less important than getting their, first of all, battling corruption and getting their economy back on in shape. So the most important thing we can do is economic, is also putting every kind of condition that we can to help the young people in that government create a decent government. Then, so I will answer your question, having dodged it now for okay. a couple minutes. Uh, I, I wrestle with this. My initial reaction was the last thing we need to do is fuel this conf conflict further. More guns, more conflict, more, uh, more destabilization. That actually plays into Russia's hands. That said, Ukraine is a sovereign government, and as a sovereign government, to the extent the Ukrainians want defensive weapons that we would supply to others, it's hard for me to say we should not be supplying them with at least that level uh, of defensive weapons. But I would not, so this is, this is somewhere between John McCain's position and the administration's position, which is to say, no, I do not think we want to fight a proxy war with Russia by arming Ukraine. I think that is not, the, that is not going to help the Ukrainian people at all. On the other hand, A, I would make, uh, you do want to make clear to Russia that you are standing in the government's camp and that there is, there is some limit there. Uh, and you also want to treat the, you want to give the government what it needs to defend itself, but not, not offensively. And is there more that we should be doing in terms of development aid, aid, uh, economic aid to uh, Ukraine? Absolutely. Despite the corruption? Uh, yes, but the, the, here again, the question, I mean, I've, I, I, uh, at Davos this year, I met with a number of the, the people in the government, and they're really extraordinary. I mean, they're, they're, they're young, and they are doing, you know, they really see themselves more the way the, the Polish government did uh, after Solidarity, mm -hmm. after uh, we're really trying to turn that country around. And it can turn around, right? We've seen other countries in Eastern and Central Europe turn around. There's no reason that it can't. But again, the, the issue there is less geopolitics and much more corruption and basic economic right. growth. And so that's where we should focus, the EU should focus. The EU is even better than we are at this. So before we move regions, um, just to fo follow up, I mean, the, the thing about the people-centered approach, I just keep coming back to in my mind, what happens when you come up against a well-armed bad guy? Yeah, okay. I mean, so, so let me make clear again, this is not either or. And this okay. is what happens to those of us who want to talk about people. We get immediately painted into that nice little idealistic, unrealistic corner. I'm, I completely recognize the relevance of geopolitics. Um, you'd be nuts, as I said, not to think that geopolitics weren't still important. But I won't allowed, what, what happens then is geopolitics takes over. And we, because it's so much easier Right? I mean, there's only 200 states, and there are only about 20 of them we have to think about, and it's just a whole lot easier to play that out than to deal with really ugly, naughty problems like how you get rid of, of corruption in Ukraine. So what I want to say is absolutely, you know, when you get to a point where you know, Russia is uh, rattling its sword, for one thing, security will trump economics. I mean, I've, I won quite a lot uh, and with my corporate friends by saying, you know what, Angela Merkel's going to apply those sanctions. And lots of corporate folks are, oh, no, she's not going to do that. That would be terrible. German energy, German trade. No, no, no. No, she is, right? When it comes down to it, security will trump, trump economics, just the way politics will trump economics, which is why the euro is still there. So there is a point at which you make that jump to the chess world, no question. But 
at the same time, you gotta walk and chew gum at the same time, you gotta be able to think about the complexity of the human issues or the people-centered issues at the same time that you're recognizing, yeah, you know, the bad guys are still out there and there's gonna come a point where you, you're gonna have to say, okay, we're back to chess. So let's move to a country that I know is you feel very passionate about, and that's Syria, of I course. Feel, um, uh, I'm so calm. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this is the four-week uh, anniversary of the uprising there. We're talking about 200,000 people dead, um, an estimate of 9 million displaced. Um, I know, um, I've, you, when you and I have talked in the, in the past, you uh, supported army, the Syrian rebels a couple years ago, not now. Um, and you were also uh, very strongly of the opinion that Assad's uh, air bases should be bombed. He shouldn't have the ability to attack his own population. Um, and you've written that, um, you know, you wrote recently, why is the threat of ISIS in Iraq a sufficiently vital threat, but not the rise of ISIS in Syria? Uh, where do you see things stand there? Apply your uh, people-centered theory to both what we should have done and what we should be doing now. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I was reading last week that the Turks are insisting on protection zones uh, on the Turkish border as the condition for uh, fighting ISIS uh, the way we want them to. And I thought, you know, it's been three years ago I wrote a piece in the New York Times calling for no-kill zones, right, mm -hmm. uh, on exactly the same grounds that fundamentally you had to provide the Syrian people with a place where they could be safe. At that point, of course, you didn't have Jabhat al-Nusra, you didn't have ISIS, you, you still largely had moderates uh, in the Syrian opposition. You'd only had a free Syrian army even, uh, even carrying arms for six months. You had a lot of opportunity. Uh, and here we are, three years later, 200,000 people uh, destroyed, over half the Syrian population displaced internally or in Jordan, destabilizing the region. We will never put Syria back together again the way it has been. And on top of that, we are watching the world's cultural heritage be destroyed. So, um, you know, do I know that had we done that three years ago, we wouldn't be where we are now? No. Absolutely not, there's no way you can say that. Maybe it would have been worse, but I'll follow Hillary Clinton. I'd rather be caught trying mm -hmm. than not trying. Uh, and so here's where the people-centered approach comes. Because most people, when they hear me say this, think I'm talking about humanitarian considerations. They think my heart is bleeding for the Syrians, which it is, yeah. and I'm not ashamed of that. Uh, but uh, as in fact, as a human being, when I look at this and I think any ability we have to stop that, we should try, not at the cost of killing our own people, but in ways we can. But I'm not thinking about it just in a humanitarian way. I'm thinking about it in a strategic way. I am thinking, exactly as I said before, that all sorts of bad things happen in the world when people are killed, maimed, their property is destroyed, they're displaced, their worlds collapse. When that happens, they tend to either take sides to fight back, or they go to refugee camps, and all sorts of terrible, radical, extremist things happen. In our own cities, those tend to be gangs. In Think about the Great Lakes. Think about what happened after the Rwanda genocide. We are still fighting the Great Lakes, Lakes War. We are not, the Central African countries are. Two million dead. So what I'm actually looking at is, if you're worried about radical Islam and terrorism in the Middle East, and you are now looking at an entire half a country that is having their lives destroyed, and the United States said that we wanted Assad to disappear but didn't do anything, you're just harvesting more trouble down the road. You have to think about the people and what the people are gonna do strategically and not just in terms of human, uh, humanitarian uh, concerns. And from that point of view, the idea, to go back to your ISIS point of view, that we are all upset about ISIS and ISIS is terrible, I understand ISIS is terrible. If I were a mother whose child were killed, I, I'm not sure I'd distinguish between Assad's barrel bomb and ISIS. I'm just not sure I would think that was such an incredible distinction that the United States should mobilize completely in the one case and do nothing mm -hmm. in the other, nothing. We are not willing to even bomb his air force so that he can't drop barrel bombs on people. That is something we could have done. The Israelis have been in his airspace three or four times without any problem. We could have done that. 
We might then say we can't put boots on the ground. We're, this is not something where we are going to sacrifice American lives directly. We also don't think that'll work, but we would have tried. That would have, at the very least, reduced the suffering and said we don't just care about people dying when they behead Americans. We actually care when equal atrocities are being visited on hundreds of thousands of people. So what now? So what now? What I be, still would, would go for protection zones. I okay. still think, uh, I think the Turks are right. I think there is no way out of this without addressing the Syrian civil war. So that's the starting point. And that is infinitely harder to do than it was three years ago. And now, would I send arms to Syrian groups now? No. I mean, I don't even know where, where I'd start. I mean, no, now I would not do that. Would I try to create uh, some kinds of safe zones? Yes. Would I, above all, again, try to force Assad to the table? By, I still would bomb his air, his air Force, I would, but I would do whatever it took to get him to the table, and I would make clear that there isn't going to be a solution to ISIS until there's a solution in Syria as well. That may take a long time to get there, but I don't see us solving this problem in general anytime soon. So um, I want to go further into the whole terrorism issue, but just still on Syria. Um, and using your people-centered approach. This is a question from Lori Bertman, who's, a, um, who's in Baton Rouge. Um, hi, Lori. And um, she's a great supporter of a CSIS, but she points out rightly that USAID uh, notes that Syria is the biggest humanitarian crisis of our era, yes. right? So how do you get people aware of the long-term impact? But I would even take that to a different step. What will be the long-term impact? Oh, I mean. I mean, just to say again, Syria is the Rwanda of this administration. I mean, the Syria, and this was foreseeable. This was completely foreseeable. We saw it happening. It, it is the greatest humanitarian crisis. You could see that this was a government that was going to stop at nothing, right? You have to remember, the Syrians started marching nonviolently, right? They marched from March 2011 until October 2011 before they even took up arms. You could see this government would do whatever it took, and you could see that unless somebody actually took on the government, it wasn't going to stop. Um, where do we have now? You know, now it's become a commonplace. I remember saying this of a year ago on at Fareed Zakaria's show, hearing and agreeing that we were facing a 30 years war in the Middle East. Well, that's now, that's sort of the start, and people say that all over the place. You know, the 30 years war killed a third of the Europe's population. Uh, and I don't think this war is going to take 30 years, but the Lebanese war took 16. We could easily be looking at a decade of war and think about the toll in terms of the, the human cost, the strategic cost, the economic cost, and conceivably, I mean, we'll see whether there are nuclear weapons in the mix. One would assume not, but I think we're going to be living with the aftermath of this or the ongoing problem of this for the next decade. And you uh, are also, of course, seeing the rise of a powerful player in all of this, Iran. Yes. How is that going to play out? What do you see happening? Okay, so once again, from the geopolitical point of view, Iran, from the chessboard, Iran's our enemy, right? right? And or our adversary, I'd say our enemy. We're the great Satan. The, they, uh, we ha don't have diplomatic relations. They certainly sponsor terrorism against us. So from the chessboard point of view, this is... Okay, we are aligned with Saudi Arabia, uh, with Egypt, with Israel, with the enemies of Iran. Iran is our adversary. When, as we move closer to Iran, that makes people very nervous. You play it out. All true, all important. We, you know, this is a this is a, a state that can do a lot of damage and is fighting directly against, you know, obviously supporting Assad in Syria. From a people-centered point of view, the Iranians are the most pro-Western uh, group of people as a whole in the Middle East. They are a civilization and with a history that are far more likely to be pro-Western over time than Saudi Arabia so is. So how do you use that? So how do you use that? You buy time. You buy time. You understand that Iran, if you just look at the demographics, the, the huge proportion of population that are under 30, who are digitally connected, who are, are largely pro-Western, unless we actually take out nu uh, their nuclear installations, in which case we will, we will change that. You buy time and you let demographics take their course. And you understand that 
over time, we are more likely, as I said, to be closer to Iran because of what's going to happen in Iran than we are lots of other parts of the but Middle East. But that's assuming that young people are more tolerant and young people fill the ranks of terrorist organizations. Well, right. young people do, but again, if you look at the population of Iran and you look at the degree of education and their own sentiments, mm -hmm. right? This is, I mean, I remember once talking to an Iranian about this, and I said, well, why is this? I mean, why are young Iranians much more pro-Western? And he said, do you have a teenager? Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah. And he said, why are you asking me that question? I mean, and his, he was flipped, but his point was, you've had a whole generation that's been raised on the idea that the United States is the great Satan. Right. And, you know, not surprisingly, you've got a lot of people who, who also are isolated, who question the, the, we saw the Green Revolution. And I'm not saying there's going to be a, a revolution. I am saying just over time, young people will start holding power, and there's every reason to believe that Iran will moderate. And it goes back to this earlier question about Russia I had. It's an interesting question. Is there a way to reach populations the in these hostile these, these countries that are governed by hostile governments. Right. Um, uh, digitally, I mean, is there a, a more creative way to reach and shape public opinion? So that falls exactly in the category of what I said about um, the strategy of connection. And I don't have a great answer. What I would like to be able to say is, there are three or four different kinds of networks you can build. Here's the kind we ought to be building to build those kinds of relationships that will last over time. Here's the way we do them. Here's, here are the, the tools with which to do them. We don't have that yet. Often our efforts to reach the people backfire. Right. right. I mean, so we know if it comes from the state. Absolutely. Department. Yeah. So we, we now know better. That's why I said with it with Russia, actually, the best thing we can do is not is, is a sort of negative strategy of not intervening in ways that allow Putin's, allows Putin to set us up as the enemy. The way that you try to support, well, yes, we support NGOs. Again, that often uh, does backfire. How do you reach uh, a actual Rus you know, Russians who you think support you? You know, I'm not sure, it, at least in Russia and now, that there's any sort of immediate way you can do that. I think long term, you can do that. You can think about Russian students who've gone back. You can, but again, th then you come back to the tools. That can't be the State Department. That has to be ways in which you're either working through universities or NGOs or, or businesses uh, in ways that you, you can do with a, with a very light footprint. Some of this we did do during the Cold War, but it was all CIA funded. Now mm -hmm. we would be trying to do this quite differently. So let's talk about, oh, before we go, um, Iran, the nuclear yes. nego negotiations. What's your view on that? Well, for the real, I, I mean, I, we have to see the deal. Assuming that the deal pushes the Iranian breakout ability to a year or more, and assuming there really are the kinds of guaranteed uh, um, investigations, examination, access uh, for the IAEA, I would support the deal. Um, you know, I, I buy the, the position that Bob Einhorn put forward in the, in the New York Times, I thought was right. I mean, you have to be really realistic that they're not great choices. In the time we haven't had a deal, the Iranians have moved from 1,000 centrifuges to 5,000 to 10,000. And guess what? If we don't have a deal, they'll ju they will just be that much closer uh, to the kind of uranium they need to have a bomb very quickly. So we're, we're talking about playing for time. I again think, I think there are lots of reasons why the Iranian government does not want to move to actually make a bomb. I think they're not going to give up their ability to do that at some point. So what I think we want to do is buy time. I also think that if there's a deal and we're the ones who um, are seen as blocking it, we're going to lose our coalition. I and mean, we're going to see the Russians and the Chinese and the Europeans uh, re reducing sanctions. And that's, that's not going to help anybody. The Iranians are going to get lots of support, and we're, we're not going to get the benefit of the deal. So let's talk about um, terrorism more broadly. So just, we've got ISIS, um, Al-Qaeda, Yemen, um, Boko Haram. You told me at the Fortune, Summer last, uh, Fortune Summit last October, the White House refused to recognize both the spreading and fueling of extremism. But the White House did not want to get involved in another Middle East war, so we effectively limited our assistance to human, just to humanitarian aid. In Syria, I was probably talking. In Syria, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and, and then, I, you know, to contrast that with um, uh, National Intelligence Director James Clapper recently saying, 
terror trend lines now are worse than at any other point in history. Um, again, let's, let's take this people's, I mean, there's the military aspect to this, but is there a people approach that might be more effective? You started, you started talking about that, you know, uh, you know how, how young people become terrorists. Um, what would you do to add another component in our fight in the war on terror? Um, well, so let me, let me try to situate that. So in, in, um, I was talking about Syria, and I was saying, look, we basically just wanted to seal it off, and we wanted to, to kind of just let whatever was going to happen in Syria happen in Syria. And now that it's spilled over, which was, again, quite foreseeable, yeah. now we can't. Now we have to actually address it. But now, as I said, we're in this crazy position where we're addressing ISIS in Iraq, and we're not doing anything in Syria. And of course, people, it, it, you just can't, can't separate it out that way. I mean, with respect to terrorism long term, I do think that your best strategy against terrorism long term is development. I mean, I really think development is, it's a long, it's, I've called it realism with a longer time frame, right? It, 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 takes, it does take a long time. On the other hand, if you just look in my lifetime, the countries that were, uh, you know, really desperately poor, uh, that are now approaching middle income by some definition, you know, de development is, is happening. So from my point of view, a lot more of uh, investment in the kinds of things that USAID does, but also the kinds of things that state does increasingly uh, in terms of, of working uh, for women's rights, uh, on <coughs> entrepreneurs, on civil rights of different kinds, actually engaging populations uh, in various ways. The question that I don't have an answer to um, in terms of uh, it's explicit, not terrorism, but radical, violent Islamist terrorism uh, is, is the question that was posed in the Atlantic cover article recently. You know, what does ISIS mm -hmm. want? You know, you read that mm -hmm. and you read it's a, a kind of um, this just desperation for a code, a world, a family, a certainty. It's not, I mean, I remember attending a, um, a Google Ideas Summit on violent extremism where they had neo-Nazis, Crips and Bloods, former members of Al-Qaeda, and what came through, uh, they were young men who were uh, radically displaced, radically disaffected, and looking for something all-encompassing. I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, we know that in the micro. We, there are programs that work in terms of letting people come out and trying to re-socialize them. But that's a problem, as I said, that we see in our own society, and people turning to violence. And now we're seeing it on a mass scale with a religious veneer uh, that can be extremely appealing in the sense of a completely coherent worldview, you know, that you're going to follow the, the, the Quran in a fundamentalist way. And how we fight that as a matter of foreign policy, I don't have an answer. And how you inject um, female values into... Yes. Uh, well, I should have said, yes, no. Uh, uh, supporting women in, in across the board will help, I mean, in the, in the sense of engaging women in thinking about how you counter terrorism, engaging women on, in peace negotiations of every kind, engaging women to even look at what's happening in their communities and, to, and help you think about it and help you address it? Yes, absolutely, that, that for sure. Um, and your people-centered approach, China. Let's yes. talk about China, yes. which, um, I, I, you know, it just arrested five women protesters, um, you know, and there's sort of continued clamp down on dissent. Uh, you obviously have uh, aggressions in the South China Sea and so forth. Um, how would you, how does that fit into the... So, th so that's another great one, I think, for both, right? So you start from the chessboard, and you see a rising power, uh, and you see status quo powers around it, uh, with Japan and with Korea and the United States, uh, and you see a pretty classic geopolitical case. And the question everybody says is, well, well, you know, is this Germany and England, or is this England and the United States? And we know how to play that out, and we want to deter them without encircling them. And then we're, we're right back into the world. It's not easy, but it's familiar. It's a, and we know how to think about 
Uh, the coalitions we have to build in East Asia, that's again what uh, this administration I think has done very well in the sense of, of our being present. You can, you can disagree with specific things we've done, but I think being there, uh, making clear that this is something that's enormously important and we're not going away, I think all that's right. That's, so that's the, the, the geopolitical world, that's the chessboard world. At the same time, you have to be focusing on the insecurity of the Communist Party, right? So again, Xi Jinping is consolidating power in all sorts of ways, but he's consolidating power at a time when the authority and the legitimacy of the Communist Party are fraying enormously, right? They've, they've, they haven't had a communist ideology for decades. They've had a capitalist ide ideology wrapped in a Marxist wrapper that has delivered a steadily improving uh, standard of living. Now you have tons of young people. You have, you have tons of young people, but you also have an aging society. So it's a, it's a very dangerous uh, combination. And you have the bonds of family that once would have held that together have been ruptured in so many ways. You have rising expectations. You have uh, millions of college graduates who can't find college graduate jobs. You have a whole young pe population of nationalists who feel like, okay, China is the big country in the world and we need to be treated that way. And you've got a government that has to ride that tiger. And you have an internet. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. It's not particularly friendly. <laughs> right, so, so from a people-centered point of view, you're actually, you're A, looking at that constantly and analyzing what Xi Jinping is doing in terms of how he's responding to domestic forces more as much as or more than how he's responding to international forces. And those are the two, that's a people-centered and a state-centered view simultaneously. And you've got to constantly be looking through both lenses. But then when you start thinking about, all right, well, what are our tools, though, from mm -hmm. a people-centered approach? Some of them we're using very well. All the educational exchanges, I think that's all to the good. I mean, the, and, and I would go further. I would make it possible for, I mean, the US educational system is locked into our you know, two semesters or three quarters system. It's very hard, actually, if you're a, a former professor, to teach part of the time in China and part of the time here. There are all sorts of things we could do that would make it easier to create those kinds of educational relationships uh, in ways and that, that would not just be corporate. I, I would absolutely do that. The environment. Mm -hmm. right? The environment is probably the, one, the best way we can engage the Chinese people. It is the, huge, the biggest problem. I lived in Shanghai for a year. I couldn't imagine having lived there longer. I had an oldest child with asthma, and even for, for my husband and me, I was worried. This was 2007, 2008. I never would have kept my kids in that environment later. And Chinese parents, obviously, are, are very worried. China and Japan, A, have an incredibly intense economic relationship, but Japan and Japanese-Chinese relations in terms of environmental assistance, it's the closest, it's the area in which they're closest. That's where we should be building. That's interesting. Right? That, those are the That's places. People to people. It's people to people, but it's more than that. It's economic, yeah. it's people. Um, things like also thinking about how you engage the Chinese on the stewardship of water. Right in the entire region, uh, where again we did some of this in the State Department with the Mekong River Initiative, thinking about what are those issues that affect the Chinese where they live, in ways that can help dispel some of the distress or just create the human relationships that we are, we we're gonna we need to overcome crises, it should be the parallel foreign policy track. It's not that we don't do some of this, it's just that that's always secondary. Right. right. My point is to make it, it equal. It's not to pretend we don't ever do this, and it's not to say the other's not important. It's to say they're equally important. North Korea. Yeah. Now that one's much harder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one, I, it's very hard to think about from a people-centered point of yeah. view, because that is still you know, a deeply closed Unless society. you could reach those people somehow. I mean, other countries do, right? If you were in Sweden, you could travel to North Korea. It's not, you know, it's not as isolated as it is from us. But overall, yes, that's the way the government wants it. Um, but it, well, I, I'll give you one example on North Korea, though, from a people-centered point of view. We, we had the most influence on the North Korean government through the Banco Delta Initiative under George W. Bush at the end of his, uh, toward the end of his tenure. What did we do? we choked off the North Korean regime's ability to pay for fancy goods, right? For liquor, for 
for the things that make it nice to be in the North Korean regime. And we did it so effectively that it scared the Chinese very badly that the regime could collapse and, and they put various pressure and we stopped. That was a great example of thinking about not the North Korean regime as the government, but thinking about those individual people and how, how they lived and applying a tool. It intersected the chessboard world in ways that were complicated when we stopped, but it was a way, I think, a much more creative way of thinking about uh, smart sanctions, right. essentially. So what do you think the US leadership role in the world should be? And are we possibly moving to a G2 world of China and US as the, the superpowers? And, and, but again, the, especially the first question, what should the US um, leadership role in the world be? So uh, I like leading from the center. Okay. Um, that, that, that's just me. Uh, but what do you mean by that? So uh, what I mean by that is we are, it, in both the chessboard world and the people world, in either case, in the chessboard world, there are multiple powers, right? We are not, I mean, the, Joe Nye always does his, his three-dimensional chess where there's the military chessboard and the economic chessboard and the transnational chessboard and military, we're number one, and economics, it's multipolar, and uh, I, don't, I can't even remember how he does transnational. Um, I would say in the world of great powers, even militarily, although we're still you know, vastly ahead of any other given country, the amount of usable military power we have, it's much harder, right? Because there's an awful lot of the power we have we can't use or we're not going to use. Um, and in terms of usable power to being able to actually deploy troops, special operations, all of that, in all of those, in, in that world, we're going to lead best, we're gonna work best when we're working through partners and coalition partners. So even there, I'd say leading from the center means, I know that it, the aftermath has been uh, unsuccessful, but if you look at the Libya intervention, you have a very good example of where actually Europe had much more at stake than we did in terms of migration, in terms of economics, and the Europeans led that effort. Uh, that was an example of leading from the center. We were there. We, as the president said, we created the conditions and the coalitions for others to step up. So we were absolutely there. We played a central leadership role, but we were not out front. That was leading from the center. Uh, and that means we have to have skin in the game. One of the reasons I'm frustrated with us in the Middle East with Syria is we're not doing anything. We want other people to do things. We want them to do what we want to do. That's not true to say we're not doing anything. We are, but we're not doing enough. It's very hard for us to then assemble the coalition to do what we need it to do. Um, and in the, so in the, in the geopolitical world, it means working through coalitions and partners and being willing to do enough, but also willing to let others get out ahead and willing to do things their way some of the time, which is hard for us. Are um, we showing enough leadership on Russia? On Russia, yeah. I've, I've actually been, I, I really give the, give the administration high marks. I mean, if, to the extent that you, there's a lot of other terrible things that could have happened that have not. Uh, and aside of uh, just avoiding straight conflict, uh, in some, I thought it was quite likely after Sochi when the, uh, before the Russians invaded Crimea and we were still talking about the Ukrainian government, Yanukovych was still in power, I thought there was a very substantial chance the Russians would send troops in to bolster him, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I really thought we were back to the, you know, Prague or, or, or Hungary in 1956. So from that point of view, he invaded Crimea, but the rest of Ukraine actually got a revolution and a government that was favorable right. to Europe. That was not a given. And there are any number of ways that once that happened, you could have inflamed that crisis. As I said, I thought we initially led from the front and then we backed off and have helped uh, work with the Europeans who have far more at stake in terms of trade and, and, other, and energy relations, but we're there. I, I think I give us high marks there. Um, but then I would say leading from the center in the web world, in the people-focused world, is absolutely thinking about what are all the networks we have to be a central node in. Think about the financial networks. Think about the energy networks. Think about the, the you know, the, the counter-terrorist, counter-criminal networks, the economic networks. 
think about it that way and figure out not how we're the only central node, that's impossible. This is not ho uh, hub and spokes. But think about we're one of three or four central nodes. We or one of our cities, right? It doesn't have to be the whole United States. It could be New York, could be LA, could be Chicago, could be Austin or Miami, uh, or Houston or Miami. But think about how are we always sure that we can we're connected to all the folks we need to be connected to. We can mobilize, deploy, convene, catalyze, make things happen. And that, in both worlds, is, I think, a role that only the United States can play. It's a different kind of leadership than 20th century leadership. It's a leadership, so we're talking about smart women, that I often find women nod their heads when I discuss. So let's say it's a leadership that women leaders may be particularly adept at exercising. At exercising. <laughs> so I want to ask you about what worries you most, and I want to do short-term, long-term. So short-term, um, you know, this time last year, were we talking about ISIS? Barely. It was a JV team. Were we talking about Russia? Well, I think yes. we, yeah, we, we were, were talking about, let's, so let's stick us back a month. We weren't talking about, we're talking about the Olympics when <laughs> yes, we thought fair, about fair Russia point, a month ago. Fair point. So, I mean, the point being that these were not, these, the, the most, um, the chief, um, danger events of this past year were not much on our radar screen a year ago, a year prior. What do you worry about in the next year? So I'm going to disagree with the premise of your question, because okay. I was deeply worried about <laughs> Syria then, and I'm deeply worried about Syria now. I mean, as Syria itself and Syria as the cancer that is spreading across the Middle East. And I would say this time last year, we might not have been talking about ISIS, but you could see that the chances of getting to a political settlement of any kind were, were getting lower and lower and lower, and that Jordan was being destabilized and Lebanon was being destabilized. And I still think we, I, I think it'll be amazing if we get out of this without serious problems with the Kurds, uh, with the Turkish Kurds actually wanting uh, to, to connect in some loose federated way with Syrian and Iraqi Kurds, and that's gonna create its own uh, set of issues. So I am still deeply worried about uh, the, the core of the Middle East, not simply because of ISIS, but because I see a region in flames and I don't see how we're putting it back together. So that's still very much uh, there. And long term, so we'll throw into these threats we've talked about, um, pandemics, um, climate change issues, uh, energy issues. Any, what black swans do you see on the longer term horizon that worry you? So I have to say, I, pandemics are very high. I always, I always locate this in terms of, so they're the kinds of things I worry about as a foreign policy expert, and I have you know, all these lovely books at night. I, you know, I, I generally put them aside and turn to a novel, but you know, they're all there. Um, and then there's the things I worry about as a human being, as a mother, right? I think, what is it out there that I, that I would read in the paper and be frightened for my children? And that's pandemics, right? It's, you know, I, I remember when the H1N1 uh, from Mexico, it was the same week that um, the, the Pakistani Taliban were within 100 miles of Islamabad and the world economy looked like it was going into a W-shaped recession. Uh, this was in May of, I think, 2010. Uh, and then the, with the H1N1, we thought it was that flu that was deadly and uh, aerosolized, right? That's the thing that terrifies us, right? For somebody who travels as much as most of us do, the idea that you're on a plane and that virus can be transmitted by the person who sneezes on the last row and that you then would carry it, and you know, that terrifies me. And the Ebola, you looked at it and you, you saw the panic it created. I and mean, it was not exactly America's finest hour, right? I mean, we had somebody, you know, in Maryland, in, in a secure facility in Maryland, and a DC practically came to a halt. And I just think all it takes is this is the kind, a SARS, but a, a deadlier SARS. So that, that's a big So one. I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna ask one more question, but I'm gonna let the audience get their questions ready. I should uh, note that um, since Anne Marie is also famous for the work-life balance, you can't have it all argument. Yet, um, you can't have it all she, yet. Um, she claims she won't answer that question because she has a book coming out, but I dare any of you to try. That's a, <laughs> go for it. 
So here's my um, question before I turn to the audience. You worked with Hillary Clinton. Uh, if Hillary Clinton asked you to come join her campaign and or administration, what's your answer? I need, uh, how, Hillary Clinton does such a good job of not answering those questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I, I am completely committed to New America for the foreseeable future. How long is that foreseeable future? <laughs> How far do you see? <laughs> okay, questions? Right here. Oh, yes. The mic is coming to you. Oh, hi. Hi, I'm Kevin Winsing. I'm on the board of uh, Finn Church Aid from Finland. A oh. uh, quick question uh, for NGOs. So much money has been put into helping people around the world, Africa, South America, so forth. A lot of corruption happens in, around the world. How, how, do we, how do you combat the, the corruption so that the money actually gets to the people? You know, we pour trillions and trillions in, and you don't see as big a result as you hope. So thank you. I mean, you, you don't see as good results as you hope, but it's, it, you do see results. I mean, I think it's important for all the you know, exposure of the corruption. Um, and, and there's certainly places where flooding the zone with money, as in Afghanistan and other places, have cre has created cre corruption. I, th I think that's, that's absolutely true. But I also think it's important to see there are plenty of places where NGOs have made a difference on the ground uh, and have helped, helped people, uh, it, you know, on the ground then, then build their own uh, society. I have a lot of faith uh, in new forms of technology uh, in terms of corruption. I mean, when I open my wallet and realize that even in five years, probably two years, and my kids already, mom, what's that piece of paper? Like, what is that? Why, why would you, you know, hand somebody a piece of paper and get coins back? Here's my phone. Right, and I was looking just uh, just this morning at you know a virtual wallet. I walked in the Trenton train station. I walked past PNC Bank. It said, "Here's your virtual wallet." And I thought, you know, I'll be using a virtual wallet. So once you can track everything as an electronic pulse, it's just going to be a lot harder. It doesn't mean that human ingenuity can find ways, you know, to get money. But honestly, the idea that you could just siphon off money uh, by moving cash uh, or by suitcases or Swiss bank accounts or whatever, I really think it's gonna, it, it, some of that is just gonna be technologically solved for. And I would add to that, we have a Smart Women, Smart Power podcast up right now, um, but it ta it's about mobile money and how it's gonna radically transform foreign aid from the, and the, um, our interview subject is the former innovation um, official for USAID and it's fascinating. Oh, right. yeah. Over, boy, there's Lots a lot of, of people right here. Can you? Quickly, up. Oh, great. Identify yourself and keep it short. Sure. Hi, Dr. Slaughter. Nice to see you. Jenna Ben Yehuda from the Women's Foreign Policy Network. You spoke in your remarks about how the current State Department configuration is just not cutting it. So, in a <laughs> blue sky, non constrained resource environment, what does that ideal look like? Oh, goodness. All right. I'll get myself into lots of trouble. So, uh, if I could wave a wand, I would completely overhaul the Foreign Service, completely. I mean, the last time we changed the Foreign Service was 1925. Right? I mean, we had minor reforms in, 19, in the 1980s, but the real one, we merged the diplomatic service and the consular service, and we created the Foreign Service in 1925. So let's say by 2025, just radical thought, we ought to have a, for, have a foreign service that is not a 30-year march to an ambassadorship that you can go in and out of at regular intervals. Mm. Uh, five years, 10 years, you can go in and you can come back out. You can be in a business. You can be in an NGO. I think most people who do public policy work ought to have experience in the private sector, the civic sector, mm. uh, and the uh, government sector, you would be able to make, you know, be in business and go in in your mid-40s or your mid-50s or your mid-60s, that there would be ways that you could represent the country, uh, get the training you needed. Yes, I mean, it's important, but it's not rocket science. Uh, you don't have to spend your whole life doing it. You would then have the ability to build these networks, right? You would know people in business. That's you would really know people point, in yes. NGOs. You could, be, you know, construct partnerships, public-private partnerships, coalitions, and you would represent the best of this country. So it's not impossible to do. We need Congress to act, but it's time. Um. Very interesting answer. 
Hi, thank you for coming and speaking with us. Lori Watkins, Truman Project. I have a question for you regarding the Malaysian Airlines, oh, airliner goodness. that went down. I, in my day job, I deal a lot with aviation and especially um, civil aviation. So that would never happen here. I mean, if that ever happened to any plane anywhere else, I'm just still fuzzy and would love to hear your opinion on why has nothing been done about that? Here what, you had, which, you know, which, uh, which in one? Crime, in, sorry, in Ukraine, that oh, shot okay. down a Malaysian okay. airliner that had yeah. passengers yeah. and people, citizens from all over the world, and yet it, it was like swept under the rug. <laughs> Nothing ever came about, no, no consequences ever came. Okay. And so from a long-term standpoint, how can we allow that to happen when we talk about terrorism and things like that and okay. not do anything about right. it? Right, thank no. you. It's a very good question. I was thinking about the other one. I was thinking, well, you know, we're searching, but uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, it was a, it was a terrible, terrible thing. But there, it's not without precedent. Remember, we the, there was the shooting down of the Korean airliner in in over Russia also, um, and there, I. A couple things. One, the Dutch government itself, which was definitely the government you would have expected to lead, did not. And it was very hard for other governments to be more outraged than the Dutch government itself. And I, you know, I don't know what the calculations were there, other than, and I don't know what may have happened behind the scenes in terms of compensation for families. I, I don't know, but I remember at the time thinking, you know, this is just absolutely outrageous, but thinking, thinking a couple things. One, it has happened before and compensation has been paid, and essentially that's that. Two, Again, the Dutch government, the EU, they would have, they, they, had they decided to try to attribute it to Russia n without question, we would have rallied, but they didn't and we didn't. And three, and it's a much deeper issue, the attribution question is one of the, another one of the great questions we now have to face, right? This whole, we know Russia's fighting in Ukraine, but they're denying it. And we don't see, you know, little green men, really? I mean, we, but, but that's a real issue for us, right? As long as they say we didn't and we have no absolute way of saying we did, it's very hard to know how to respond. And that's a much bigger question. Okay, I'm gonna go over right here. Identify yourself and make it short. Good so afternoon, a lot of them in. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your uh, um, presentation. Uh, um, looking at Africa, you mentioned about Rwanda genocide comparing to Syria. Uh, we now have Boko Haram in Nigeria, yes. uh, Al Shabaab in Somali, and others coming in in Africa. What would you say about this? Is this terrorism, hate crime, or international hate to each other? And how is this poverty, or how could you talk about this that is happening Excellent in question. Africa and here yeah. and other countries compared to African terrorism? Terror Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, and just today or yesterday, the link between Boko Haram and, and ISIS, I mean, again, this, the, it, it, and Boko Haram, to the extent what I know about it, is similarly this kind of all-encompassing, you know, rejection of all things West, uh, but ideology. also ideology. I mean, part of it, part, so the, their links, I think one of the links is a deeply corrupt environment uh, in which in, in Africa uh, more, but also in parts of the Middle East certainly and, and uh, in Afghanistan where there's a sense that you're not getting justice from the state. You're not getting the, what the state is supposed to be delivering to you. Uh, this is Sarah Che's new book called Thieves of State, which is really very, very good. And she makes a very powerful argument that says when corruption gets to a certain point, you often see religious extremism because it's this alternative universe that you can live in that provides what the state's supposed to provide. And so that, in fact, we're fueling extremism by pouring, to go back to your point, by pouring money in and, and, and uh, making corruption worse, we're actually making the terrorism problems worse, the very problems we're try trying to fight. Um, there again, I, you know, I, I think the thing that I am 
the only good silver lining, it's impossible to say there's real silver lining, but the only slight good thing is that because there's now a connection to ISIS and it's seen as more global, people are gonna pay more attention to groups like Boko Haram than we should have been paying more attention to all along. Um, sorry, right there, gentlemen. Sorry, there's a lot of questions. Hi, I'm John Rothenberg, Afghanistan specialist. Um, one of my closest old time, I, I've been in, off and on for night, since 1988. Um, one of my closest and oldest Afghan friends um, is also one of the only people I know there that's always optimistic. And the reason he's always optimistic is because um, he says six more years of female education and there'll never be any problem here again. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and his daughter's in university in India. Um, but uh, from what I see from Iran, from what I see from China and the abortion of females um, and the uneven population, I think there's a great deal to that um, thought everywhere. And, and uh, to me, the long-term solution to instability has to always include education of, of females. And I don't think we fund it enough elsewhere. And, and, and I want your, your comment on that. So let me just, the um, No Ceilings report is out yes. that shows, yes. you know, that actually women are getting educated. That's a good example. Afghanistan, it's relatively new, but women are getting educated, mm -hmm. women and girls, mm -hmm. at a mm -hmm. higher rate, not in the workforce. They're, they're, uh, workforce participation is actually stagnated so over the past 20 years so you know that's a you know what are the both opportunities and limits of um, having girls educated mm -hmm. so I, I mean I do think as a matter of, of history and economics the the more if you use all your talent and if you are educating women who are educating their children uh, and who are providing the anchor for families uh, in ways that, that create opportunity, you are developing. And if you look, I mean, you can look at European history. You don't have to look at Afghanistan. You can look at European history and see that the countries that educated women the most and the used women the most actually uh, flourished uh, the most. Uh, so uh, I, I, I do think, you know, I, we will have arrived when we're no longer talking about women's issues as part of foreign policy, when we are simply talking about educating the population, employing the population. When I talk about people-centered, that's obviously part of what I mean. You're, you're including different groups of people, and women are, are uh, the biggest. Um, the one thing I will say, though, is I think we make a real mistake when we focus on women to the exclusion of men. And when I, the, I took a trip to Liberia and Sierra Leone in 2011 in March, I led a State Department delegation. And we, we were there, we were all women, we were thrilled, we were an all women delegation, we were all women tech del, and we were talking, we had women from Google and, and Twitter and other places. And I kept looking at all these young men uh, who had been disarmed and demobilized, well not disarmed, they'd been demobilized, they still had plenty of access to arms hanging out on all the, the street corners thinking, you know, you can be an educated woman in this society, but you're not going to be either safe nor is there going to be a, a, you know, an economy that you can function in unless we get these guys jobs, right? And so part of what I think we need to think about is, yes, we need to educate women, but that alone will not get a society where it gets to go. Well, you could, the last thing you want to do is to make the same mistake by focusing on women and ignoring men that we've made by focusing on men and ignoring women. We want to be thinking about women and families and care for each other and, and investing in others, which has been traditional women's, women's work, but it's human work. All right, it, this is Hillary Clinton and women's rights are human, human rights. So we want to, th and we want to think about that in terms of our sons and our husbands and our fathers and our brothers in the same way we want to think about that as our sisters and our, and our mothers uh, and our daughters. So I, I worry that we, we may tip too far as much as I also do want to see women educated. Um, make, yes, right here, thank you.
identify yourself and yes, indeed. make a short Thank you question. So much. We only have a couple of minutes. Uh, my name is Rita Heron Adkins. I think my question would be quite a good segue to the gentleman's uh, uh, question regarding education. Uh, Ms. Slaughter, you had in your article regarding why women can't make it uh, in the Atlantic, apparently it's got almost about a quarter of a, uh, about three quarters of a million readers all over the world. <laughs> so my question is that you had also written that or suggested that uh, a shift in work hours, uh, which is sort of kind of carried by women, and that is a deterrent to sort of their progress. Uh, you had recommended that. There is also talk about equity so far as uh, wages are concerned. My question is, what would be, you think, would be the effect of this policy if pursued uh, in the developed countries as well as in the developing countries? Which, which policy? policy? Which policy? I'm sorry. In the developed countries. Yeah, but which policy? I'm sorry. Uh, about the shifting of the work hours and responsibilities to women, to men also, as you had suggested. And also there is this thinking that equity also in wages. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Do you believe in equal yeah, wage right. laws? And I have a short question about- That's it, thank you, thanks okay. so much. Thank yeah. you. So I just have to correct the records. Uh, so the title of that Atlantic article was Why Women Still Can't Have It All. I've never argued that women can't have it all, mm -hmm. I, if, by which we mean women should be able to have the same combination of career and family that men do. All I was saying was that we still need to make a bunch of changes, uh, and I'm perfectly happy to still say that. Uh, we, and one of those changes, I mean, yes, equal pay for uh, equal wages, absolutely. Uh, but honestly, the changes I would make would be to be to create uh, universally uh, affordable, high-quality daycare, uh, family leave, uh, and deep flexibility. Deep flexibility meaning that we would focus much more on results than we would on time served uh, in, in, in jobs, that we would think about work uh, in the ways that, um, either in the ways that you do in sales, where you got your numbers and you make your numbers, and if you make your numbers, it doesn't matter where you are or <laughs> what time you're working, you let, well, you let people do it. Uh, or more generally, just specifying, here's what needs to be done, and it needs to be done by this time, uh, and it needs to be done of this quality, and you let people do it. I think women and men together, this is actually where we're moving in terms of technology. This isn't just about, about women. Uh, and the companies that do this, including companies that are, are much lower wage companies, not just high end, uh, are finding that it gives people control and the ability to fit together caregiving and breadwinning in ways that there are a million different ways to do it. So I think there are a lot of changes we could make uh, that would help women but would also help men. And when I talk about uh, being able to, to be a caregiver, I think men should be able to be caregivers just as much as women should be able to be breadwinners. And for the rest, you'll have to read my book. <laughs> So as we come to a close here, I want to ask you a question about leadership. Yeah. Um, you recently said or wrote, I'm not sure which, uh, leadership styles are very personal, and it's not because everybody's yes. always giving you leadership advice. It's very personal. But I loved this comment. You said, I can chart my own career as a leader exactly in terms of how much confidence I had. <laughs> and you said, and then you talk about your husband putting you, convincing you to put your name forward yeah. for spots when you really weren't confident yeah, that you, you were ready. Yeah. So talk about that a bit. Yeah. No, that, it's, it's uh, I actually wrote a, my own story for Cheryl's Lean In website was that my, it was my husband in 2002 who convinced me to put my name forward to be president of the American Society of International Law in 2001. And I was suggesting male names and he said, you know, why don't you do it? I, I was a tenured professor at Harvard Law School. I mean, I wasn't, I sort of had a name. Uh, and I was like, I can't do that. You know, so absolutely. He was like, why not? And then I couldn't answer that question, so I put my name forward. Uh, and I also tell people, and it's true, that until I was almost 40, sometime into my late 30s, I was terrified of public speaking, which most people That's don't hard generally to believe. believe. I know, but it's true. <laughs> um, so Did I, you get over that just by doing mm -hmm. it? Okay just by doing it and doing it and doing it. It's like anything else, mm -hmm. you know, at some point you realize talking to you is not really any different than talking around the kitchen table. And I don't generally need notes at the kitchen table, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
No, I think absolutely. Uh, you know, and this is, again, an area where I agree with uh, the Confidence Gap book, and I agree with Sheryl Sandberg's work, that um, there are so many ways in which our confidence is undermined. And there are the, all these subtle little micro behaviors where, you know, you're talking and the guy is impatient for you to finish, right? Those little tiny ways where, you know, he fidgets or, you know, it's the, the equivalent of you walk into the cocktail party and the person you're talking to looks over your shoulder. And you right. immediately, you know, you talk a little less articulately, you shrink a little. It's, it's those, those ways that human beings give each other status cues and we're very attuned to them. And as a woman in what is still a man's world, it is very hard to, uh, to get the confidence to assert yourself the way you would say if you were in your family or with your close friends, to be that person that you know you are. Uh, but you know, as I, I wrote in my book, even at 50, when I showed up at the State Department the first morning of the you know, secretary's early morning meeting, and I'm the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, and I'm the first director of policy planning, and, you know, and I walk in, and there's the Secretary of State, and there's a whole room full of people, the two deputies and all these people, and every single one had been in government before, and I never had. And I think it took six months before I uttered an intelligent remark. Wow. I, I, I mean, in other words, I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't, I didn't have yeah. that confidence yeah. that you do when you know you're, you're relaxed. So yeah, conf it's not all of leadership, but it's a big piece of it. Well, on behalf of this entire audience, we are so glad you found your public voice <laughs> because you truly are brilliant and we love hearing your insights well, and you. vision on thank foreign you. policy. Thank you. Thank and you thanks so to much. CSIS and the city.